Welcome to uh, yeah. the bio lectures at Cornell University, which um, uh, are featured every year as part of uh, the AC at the local <laughs> latest stage program um, here. And today's uh, uh, lecturer is Don Tilly from um, he was you know, from Berkeley, Don and I are old friends. Going back to when I first, uh, let's see, um, had a fender bender in Don's car with. <laughs> I'd forgotten all about Missed his that. wife off. Uh, back in the trying to get tenured names done. Uh, uh, got his PhD with Dick Anderson at, uh, at Berkeley, uh, and then uh, moved on to a postdoc uh, with. John Burko, who was my PhD advisor, and also had was kind of a joint postdoc with Carol with Pino and uh, Luigi Venanzi at AKA uh, in Switzerland. So Don was was gone half the time. He has an actual postdoc with Cross Chat. So um, <clears throat> we decided that Don was good enough to come to Cornell about 10 years later after he started his academic career at the University of San Diego, but he declined us and decided to go back to Berkeley. And uh, of course, we've held it against him ever since. So, it's so, so that's why he's here 30 years later instead of earlier. But uh, we're, uh, but we're glad to have him for the Dubai the, um, lecture. Normally, we have a, a soliloquy of uh, Bob and Peter Dubai to start this off, but because we're starting a little early today, a different room, we'll save that for tomorrow. Don's research interests have spanned um, homogeneous catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis, new materials, uh, energy concerns. Um, really kind of see making metal silicon bonds and silanes and polysilanes back in the good old days. It has uh, uh, has done all kinds of stuff since. We'll see a couple of pieces of that talk of that work uh, over the next couple of days. Today we're going to focus, I guess, on some transition metal stuff involving copper and uh, for the more organically conditioned times, our lecture will be on some new materials that Don has uh, managed to create over the years that uh, have no purpose now, but look pretty cool and may have some very interesting uh, properties to fool around with uh, in time. So, Don, I'm going to let you take it away then since we're starting late. And thanks for coming and welcome to Cornell. Thank you. Hey, can everyone hear me? Okay. Well, I very much appreciate the invitation to come, the chance to come back to Ithaca. It's been, it's been great talking to people, meeting new new people today. It's been a very interesting time talking about uh, science going on here. And I hope to repay you a little bit by showing you some of our work over the past few years and, and then up until uh, our most recent interests in an area that has to do with energy and uh, in particular solar energy. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about this, this is a, a project that uh, we started about oh, 10 years ago with a few other people at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. The idea was to create a solar fuel system that uh, would bring together uh, a number of areas of science and different uh, collaborators. And the first uh, project of that type was Helios. So we were pretty involved in this Helios project and it's undergone a few uh, different iterations now. But the project has survived uh, in my group because uh, we find it very interesting and it's energy related. It's funded uh, primarily by the Department of Energy and uh, it has to do with, I can advance the slide. Many. I don't know, maybe this will work better. Here we go. Just a long delay in the slide. Uh, so the original idea we had, which we thought was uh, intellectually challenging and interesting and important, would uh, be to harvest energy from the sun using a system that we could build after the, uh, the, mo the model given to us by nature, and that is photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, we have a number of nanostructured uh, devices embedded in a, in a membrane. 
that perform the different functions uh, together in a cooperative way to convert CO2 and water to uh, stored energy in the form of carbohydrates. So the simple idea was to do something similar, starting with uh, a membrane, uh, and, and then embedded in the membrane, we would have little nanoscale photovoltaics that absorb light, separate charge, and do a similar thing. What I show here is the conversion of, of water and CO2 to methanol, but you can imagine a lot of different scenarios like this that take uh, energy from the sun and, and harvest uh, redox equivalents to drive reduction in oxidation reactions uphill. So a number of interesting technical challenges here that have to do with the, the membrane, what you would make that out of, that's still uh, a big challenge. Uh, the nature of these little photovoltaics, making all of it scalable with respect to the, the materials that go into it. And then uh, the catalysis, that's what we have focused on. And the need for catalysis is uh, emphasized on this other addition uh, to this. Maybe, here we go. Uh, this is a, a similar kind of cartoon, but what this shows is the simpler reaction of taking water to hydrogen and oxygen. So hydrogen in this case would be the fuel that you could presumably use in, in some application. And uh, the, Slide, this slide is meant to illustrate why we need catalysts for this reaction. And it has to do with the inherent activation energy associated with many, most reactions, as depicted over here in electrochemistry, we refer to that as the overpotential. And so the reactions that we need to carry out to bake, make and break bonds at uh, the surface of this device, this membrane, uh, needs to be catalyzed to lower that overpotential so we, that we waste as little of the incident solar energy as possible, right? So the half reaction that we'll focus most on is probably the more difficult one. That is the splitting of water to oxygen. And that's a four electron, four proton half reaction as you see down here. And uh, we have been interested in catalysts for that. F reaction. Now, if we look at again, again to nature, what we see is that nature pulls off this reaction with a very interesting inorganic reactive site. And that active site has four manganese and a calcium positioned in, in the manner that you see here. So four of the metals form kind of what we call a cubane. Uh, they're bridged by oxygens. And this is a very efficient catalytic system. Very fast, the overpotential is, is really incredibly low, about 70 millivolts. And in this reactive center, which we still don't entirely understand, uh, you have these metals I referred to in the cubane, and then this dangler manganese, which is playing some role in the conversion of water to oxygen. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. So this is uh, an active site that, that uh, brings about a multi-electron oxidation. And in some way that we would like to understand, the metals are cooperating uh, to make this happen, this multi-electron uh, process. I might have to go to the computer here. Yeah, this works. Okay, so uh, one of the metals that bring the laptop to the side, maybe the screen is blocking the. Uh, yeah, good uh, idea. One of the metals that we began to look at, and a number of other groups did as well, is cobalt, and that's because cobalt is relatively abundant not as abundant as uh, manganese or iron maybe, but it's a first row metal. And it's known that cobalt oxides are electrocatalysts for this water splitting reaction at relatively high over potential. But our approach to this problem was to try to understand how cobalt oxide does this. And if we could understand the mechanism of how water is split at this 
on this cobalt oxide, then maybe we can transfer those concepts to catalyst design uh, of a better uh, synthesized catalyst. Okay, so we're gonna go back to this. So some interesting mechanistic uh, questions to begin with were really how does the OO bond form? This is an interesting question that pertains to the OEC in photosynthesis as well. What oxygen species are actually involved? What are the oxidation states of the metals for cobalt? Two, three, four, five. That's gotten a lot of attention in uh, a number of areas of inorganic chemistry. And how many metal sites does it take to actually do this, uh, this oxidation? Well, the cobalt oxide, it seems that really does this chemistry is this layered oxyhydroxide. And the chemistry is believed to occur at an edge site at a site something like this, shown, shown here in this blow up. So in terms of how the OO bond forms, there seem to be a lot of possibilities. And I, I drew out here, I think six different OO bond forming events you can imagine based on different oxygen species at that edge structure. So we wanted to get at that and probe that. And one of the first things we did was design a binucleating ligand that allowed us to put two cobalts in close proximity and bridged by oxygens with terminal oxygen species to interrogate with respect to whether or not we form OO bonds. And to cut a long story short, we learned a lot from that system, but we never saw oxygen. So we concluded from that, that two cobalts are not enough. And then on further reflection and looking back to uh, the natural system, it made a lot of sense to us that four metals, four first row metals, makes a lot of sense. And nature of course figured this out billions of years ago. And that's because water splitting is a four electron process. And first row metals tend to do one electron redox events. That's what we've seen in many different uh, mechanistic studies done from just our group, but it seems to be a consistent trend in the redox chemistry of these metals. So four metals seem to make sense. Also in a cubane structure like this, you really have a small piece of an oxide and you can think about multiple redox events taking split space and place in a small volume. The metals cooperating to store and manage those redox equivalents, maybe orienting spins, recoupling oxygen atoms, and closely positioning uh, substrates that come in. So Andy Wynn, who's now on the faculty at uh, University of Illinois Chicago, was the first to take up this uh, cluster approach. And he chose the, the uh, cobalt oxide that you see here. I drew it here actually, and, and I indicated its uh, relevance also to that edge sites for cobalt oxide. So we thought that this particular uh, tetra cobalt oxide would be a good model for this edge site and maybe even the OEC. So Andy took up this problem and uh, I got to give him a lot of credit for this because at the time there was a lot of controversy in the literature as to whether or not this species, which had been around since 1998, was a, an electrocatalyst for water splitting or not. In fact, there's a very active group in this area who had a paper saying that it, it is not. But he persisted. He wanted to learn about the chemistry of this species at different pHs. Uh, and uh, in particular, the electrochemistry. So you see some of that data here. So at neutral pH, you see a nice reversible wave for the oxidation of this cube. And the interesting thing right away about that is that that means you can access something that's formally cobalt-4 in the system. Now, you might not have an isolated cobalt-4. I'll come back to that. But it means that you're, you're getting to an oxidation state that's unusual in isolated cobalt species. The poor bay diagram shown here uh, indicates that uh, this species is protonated in solution and the redox uh, chem chemistry and potentials are reflecting an equilibrium involving uh, protonation. We know that pretty well now. We, we can have a crystal structure of, of the protonated species itself. But then at pHs that are higher above about nine, you start to see this catalytic wave. And you can also tell that oxygen in that, uh, in that process. 
So what is what is happening there? Well, you can uh, you can take the electrode out and rinse it and see that activity go away. And that's one indication people have used that the species in solution, in solution is actually doing the electrochemistry. But that's not really proof that that species is doing the electrochemistry, right? The, the problem here in nailing down mechanisms in catalytic water oxidation is that if you're at a potential that's high enough to split water, you're at a potential, potential to break almost any ligand you have and convert whatever species you add to cobalt oxide. In fact, most every cobalt species that we had looked up, looked at up until this point, we could tell was decomposing to that layered cobalt oxyhydroxide, which is then the catalyst for water splitting. So is that a real catalyst? Well, uh, we have to really do kinetics to really figure out whether that species is, a, is the real catalyst or not. And I have here a couple of quotes that some of you may know that are uh, fairly well known in the organometallic and catalysis literature. This one by Jack Halpern, which says catalysis is by, is by definition a kinetic phenomenon. Okay, so you have to use kinetics to really get at what uh, is affecting the kinetic. You have to look at kinetics to get at the catalyst for that uh, phenomenon. And then uh, this quote is also from Jack Halpern, which basically, if you can see a species in a catalytic system, then it's probably not the catalyst. And this is uh, uh, a quote from uh, Jack Halpern, but uh, in this paper by John Burkhoff. So the key objectives for us were to really determine, is, is that uh, cobalt cubane a catalyst? And if so, can we identify and uh, confirm catalytic intermediates and obtain kinetic data? that would indicate that. Okay, so one of the first things Andy was able to do is show that he could oxidize the cube uh, in a one electron oxidation with cerium. So that gave us a crystal structure of this oxidized species, which again, formally has cobalt four in it. You can think about it as formally cobalt three, 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 four. The question of where the hole is is still uh, something we need to address. We can tell when we form this, the NMR spectrum is relatively sharp. So you can tell when you make it, even though this is a paramagnetic species. And around the same time, Dave Britt uh, was also able to get this, this crystal structure. Okay, this is uh, really the key result that got us going down the road of studying the mechanism, which is that this oxidized cubane uh, spontaneously oxidizes water to make oxygen. And here's the stoichiometric reaction with sodium hydroxide. It goes just like this to make a fourth of equivalent of oxygen. And some of the data uh, for that is shown here. So we were very pleased to see that this is now a stoichiometric reaction, which does the reaction of interest. So it's not catalytic. It's not a reaction where you have to catch some intermediate that, that is going to be fleeting with a lot of turnover. But really, really it's just A goes to B and C. And this is then a simpler uh, reaction to deconvolute. One of the first things we did is O18 labeling. And this is the first surprise that we saw in, in looking into the mechanism of the species, which is that the O18 added in the sodium hydroxide all ends up in the O2. In other words, the oxos in this cluster do not participate in making the OO bond. I think this was a surprise, not only to us, but everybody else who had been working with these kind of uh, uh, clusters in the context of, of oxygen evolution. Okay, so that means that the catalysis is happening on the surface of that cluster. And if you think back to the six different ways I indicated, we might form an OO bond. Uh, what that meant is that that really narrows the choices down to two. Either an external oxygen is attacking an oxygen species on cobalt on the cluster, or two of them on the cluster are, are combining to make oxygen that way. Okay, you can also tell that O18 doesn't uh, get into the cluster by mass spec. And so further analysis is based on kinetics. And this is a very fast reaction 
but we found that we could study it by stop flow kinetics. And here you see the UV vis data that uh, were used to uh, establish the kinetics. We see two isospecific points, and this is room temperature data in water uh, acetyl nitrile. So there's no apparent buildup of an intermediate. And here is that kinetic data just reduced to a least squares by a least squares fitting procedure into a rate equation. And uh, this shows the data. But one of the things that jumps out you out at you immediately is the second order term in the oxidized cube. So this indicates that somehow two of these cubes have to come together to make oxygen. We spent a lot of time thinking about that. But there's also this first order term, and we now believe, and I'll uh, elaborate on this in a little bit, that this term actually has to do with the re initial reaction with hydroxide. The reaction shows saturation behavior in hydroxide, and there's no concentration dependence with the pyridine. So the pyridine isn't coming off to open up a coordination site, but hydroxide is attacking. We get this, hydro uh, this saturation behavior, and the hydroxide concentration is buried in this apparent uh, rate constant here. So pyridine has little effect, and what we've also found since we published the first paper on this is that acetate concentration doesn't either. So acetate isn't dissociating to open up coordination sites either. We think it swings away to go uh, kappa one to open up a site, but uh, uh, it does not fully come off. So here are, are some of the, in, the observations on the kinetics that are uh, taken together and what we think that means. So there's a sigmoidal profile for the concentration dependence. And that usually means you have some kind of autocatalytic or non-steady state intermediate that is involved in the reaction. Uh, there doesn't seem to be kinetic evidence for an intermediate uh, building up. There's a saturation in hydroxide in the mixed order rate law. And putting all this together, it, it seemed to suggest a mechanism that you see here it's, it's not a very commonly uh, reported type of mechanism. I think uh, Donna Blackman has an example of it. But the way it works is that the initial species goes to some intermediate that then is rapidly captured by that same initial species to give the product. And that's where the second order term would come into play. Okay, what came after that is a lot of modeling of the uh, rate constants of the reaction. And Andy spent a lot of time doing that and eventually came up with the consistent model that you see here. We have a lot of other information now that, ba that backs up this scenario. But what you see is that the oxidized uh, cubane reacts with hydroxide. And without losing any ligand, it gives this species that you see here, this hydroxide species. We think that the next thing that happens is a deprotonation to make this oxo. And I'll indicate why we think that. But, but the uh, first important step then is the hydroxide binding. And then the second one, which leads to the second order behavior, is a redox disproportionation. So the tendency, I think, it, seeing that second order term is to think about how to Cubanes would come together and form that OO bond. But in fact, we're quite convinced that that second order term is due to this disproportionation reaction, which puts another hole on a cubane. Now, that uh, is the only evidence we had for suggesting and thinking about two holes on a cubane and, and there being an oxoligand there. And that means cobalt 5. So at this point, and even still, cobalt-4 is very elusive synthetically, right? That's something that inorganic organic chemists try hard to make. So cobalt-5 seems a little bit more of a stretch, but we think that this is real, something formally with that oxidation state. The rest of the mechanism is pretty straightforward. This oxo gets attacked by hydroxide. You do some proton-coupled uh, redox events, and you come to this net stoichiometry, which is 4 the oxidized cubanes and four hydroxides give oxygen in that stoichiometric uh, reaction. Now, since acetate isn't dissociated, that uh, attack probably here looks a bit like this. 
So it's attacking in, in that species where we have the dangling acids. So with that information in hand, the next thing we wanted to do is try to deconvolute the redox behaviors of different cubes because it looked like with the redox disproportionation there that what we're seeing is just different uh, energies or different oxidations depending on the ligand sphere around the, the cubane. So that is indicated here and how those two half reactions would come together to give effect in effect uh, electron transfer. Now here I write the, the two whole product as two cobalt fours, but uh, I'll, I'll get back to that later in the talk. So Andy found that he could very easily substitute ligands in the cubane and put in more electron withdrawing groups, more electron uh, donating groups, put in hydrogen bonds, do a lot of different things. And that allowed us to start interrogating the redox properties for the, not only the first oxidation event, but the second one. So you can actually see the second oxidation in many of these cases. You see a lot of that data laid out here. So the species on the left is one of the more electron rich ones that we have. So the next interesting observation is that those redox potentials uh, obey a linear correspondence to a simple parameter, which is the summation of the pKa's of all eight ligands on the cubes. A little bit surprising, but it works pretty well. And so this linear free energy relationship is very useful for thinking about evaluating intermediates in the mechanism for catalyst design and uh, for learning more about the cubes. So this first line is the, that first oxidation. The second line is the second oxidation. I only have three of those there. But in between, you have one of the cases where there's a hydrogen bond, one of the bridging oxos. This is a potential that's displaced by about half a volt from the lower line. And it's about the same uh, potential you'll get if you just put that species in water. So there's undoubtedly water uh, hydrogen bonding to the oxos in solution. Okay, that's the parent system <clears throat> right there. And uh, if we think about this hydroxide species and uh, a disproportionation between those two species, what we see is that this, this species is really a little too high in energy to do that. So we ruled that out as the partner for that redox disproportionation. Uh, you could fully dissociate the acetate. Now these potentials are really easy to calculate, right, from using this relationship. And this is really not uh, that close either. But if you form the oxo, it, it's right in the vicinity for that disproportionation to occur and be uh, energetically favorable. That's why we think the deprotonation happens first. Okay, so having uh, a functional system that really does oxygen uh, formation, water splitting, there are several things you want to do with it. One is to stabilize that species against uh, decomposition and agglomeration. I referred to that earlier as a common problem in studying water oxidation. A lot of the papers that describe this chemistry, uh, I think really uh, involve experiments that make oxides, which are catalysts for this reaction, right? So that's a difficult thing to rule out. And you really have to use kinetics to relate the chemistry back to a given species that is a, is a candidate, as a catalyst. But we thought, well, this, this cubane probably decomposes as well. We, we now think it's a lot more stable than we had assumed, but this is one of the first things we were concerned with. And then in terms of how it works, how do the metals cooperate to, uh, to, to carry out, the, bring about the water splitting? And then how do we optimize the structure for more efficient catalysis. And can we relate any of this back to nature's OEC and how that works? So in terms of stability, one of the things we did is take uh, another lesson from nature. And this, this work came uh, after a, a conversation with Andy Borovic at an ACS meeting. 
Andy was starting to do work with streptavidin and putting uh, metal species into streptavidin using this biotin binding method. So streptavidin is a four unit protein, very crystalline and very stable to higher, uh, relatively high temperatures. And it has this 10 to the 23 binding constant for biotin. So you can put lots of different things on biotin and it'll drag it into the crystal uh, and uh, allow you to then look at the structure of whatever you've drug in, in the protein environment. So it was pretty easy for us to put biotin on the, on the cluster. And then Lisa Olshansky was the postdoc in Andy's group, went about modifying the protein uh, in different ways. The most interesting way was to put a tyrosine in the vicinity of, of the cluster. Now bringing the cluster in, uh, means that some of the acetate at least is lost, but we have waters and hydroxides then, we can't tell exactly which is where. Hydrogen bonded to the tyrosine introduced by protein engineering. And uh, so this is a good mechanistic model for the natural system because in the OEC, you also have a tyrosine hydrogen bonded to the, the cube. And this tyrosine is acting as a proton electron relay or electrons, protons going in and out of that, that reaction center. And what we're able to show with electrochemistry is that the same thing occurs here in the cobalt system. It's just that the oxidations are in the wrong direction, right? But nonetheless, we, we could come up with a pretty simple model to explain the pH dependence of the oxidations of uh, this system with and without the tyrosine there, as you can see, Big difference. Okay, here's another way to stabilize the cube. It's to put it in a rigid coordination network. And so we were able to do that using tritopic, tripyridal monomer units. And uh, you see, uh, five of the MOF type structures uh, that we made this way here. The ones that are linked, actually two of them are linked through carboxylates. Those give high surface areas, but they're not good because the carboxylates are too lay bonds. So the three down here below are ones that uh, we, we've looked at more in terms of stabilization and further mechanistic studies. And in terms of structure determination, we were helped by a PDF studies by uh, in the group of Simon Billinga at Columbia and DFT studies as well. We can tell that the cubane is present from Raman spectroscopy and X-ray techniques, EPR. And uh, bottom line is that uh, the cubanes in these networks behave very much like they do in solution. Okay, so you can oxidize them, and you see some of the corresponding electrochemistry uh, down here. You can then add sodium hydroxide. You can see oxygen. So the, the behavior is very similar to that in solution, and you can strip off the acetate by just washing in uh, sodium hydroxide solution. That gives a very active form of the cubes, and there are two things that I think are important that came out of this study. One is that this shows that the cubane uh, exists as a species that has now hydroxide and water as the ligands that uh, neutralize the system. It's at a pKa of uh, you know close to neutral. So cofacial hydroxy and aqua motifs. Uh, X-ray XF data by Junko Yano uh, indicated the, the structure that you see here. And so this is a great matrix isolation type of method where we can isolate a cube like this and then do spectroscopy on it as it goes through these reactions. So briefly, some of that is that electrocatalytically, we see the, the catalytic wave come in right at the three, four cup. That's what we see in, in solution, right? And then uh, 
the other behaviors that we have observe indicate that only about 4% of the cubes are accessed. This electrochemistry was done by taking the powderous material and just trying to shove it onto the electrode. It's not a very efficient way to make a contact. And MOPs aren't very conductive anyway. So there are a couple of issues that, that correspond to conductivity. Uh, but otherwise, the fact that this catalytic wave is growing right in the 3-4 couple means that we must have the same kind of, of uh, disproportionation reaction that we have in solution. In other words, uh, hole or electron hopping in the network, as you see here. So getting back to the mechanism, there are a couple of thoughts on how these cubanes work. And, and I know uh, our friend Dan Nacera likes a model whereby two oxyl radical type ligands combine to make the OO bond, as is shown here. We are strongly in favor of a model that starts from the aqua hydroxy cofacial species that we characterized, and then proton coupled electron transfers from there, eventually give an oxo hydroxide that couples into the uh, the peroxy, hydroperoxy species that you see here. This is that first dicobalt system we were working with. And this uh, was subjected to DFT studies that indicated the same thing. So I, this is a, an aspect of the me mechanism that we really like. Now, this issue of uh, where the holes are and how they get around in the cube and maybe between cubes is, is really the most interesting one that, that I think still exists in terms of how these kind of oxide substructures do this chemistry. And I have here uh, a, a literature reference to a paper by Gretzel, which I think is really intriguing. This, this paper shows that several different oxides that do the OER reaction, uh, do so by a kinetic model that is third order in holes on the surface. That's saying something about how the holes come together, and they discuss this in, in this paper. But coming back to the cubes, what do we, how do we think about a hole in a, in a cluster like the one we start with? Now, most of the studies have been done with symmetrically, symmetrical substitution about the, the cube. And uh, one of the first uh, postulates by Britt was that the holes delocalize. And I think that makes some sense. We now believe that this is probably the most accurate description of what's going on. Uh, there are other models that indicate that the hole is hopping around the cube like this. And then, what we now know is that two holes is what makes oxygen. And uh, Nasera and, and his group thinks that those two holes are jumping around until uh, there are two oxos there. And then that spin density is transferred to the oxygens, which then couple. It's useful to keep in mind, though, that all of this is done with uh, systems that have symmetrical ligand substitution. And the real systems that do the chemistry have oxos and hydroxos and things like that. And that's going to desymmetrize them to some extent. Okay, we've tried to make the doubly oxidized cubes. And invariably, what we found in starting with uh, systems like the one uh, you see here is that uh, instead of getting uh, a doubly oxidized cube, what we see is formation of this all cobalt three protonated cube. And so after seeing that several times and in several different solvents, we begin to ask, well, does this involve CH activation? And so we started to look at H atom transfer in clusters like this. So you can oxidize and then uh, add uh, a proton or, or, or a hydrogen atom and uh, incorporate maybe a, a species like this. And so this is a, a problem was taken up by um, John M. Tawong. I think I have her picture on the next slide. But in fact, uh, this does involve CH activation chemistry. 
So you can see that as a clean reaction with a substrate involving a, a weak CH bond. That's seen in the reaction here that makes anthracene. First order behavior for both reactants, everything is pretty straightforward in terms of the kinetics, a reasonable isotope effect. So there seems to be a rate determining hydrogen uh, atom transfer. And Jom, this is Jom, she just started her own group at Alberta. She's very excited about doing that and studying these kind of processes in different kinds of systems. But she was able to put together this square scheme, which uh, indicates a number of things. One is that the oxidized cubane uh, in protonated form would be extremely acidic. And so this is one of the pieces of evidence that, uh, that come together in the paper we, we uh, published. It indicates that this hydrogen atom transfer is concerted and not stepwise through electron transfer, proton transfer. Uh, let's see, what else? So the, the, the other main takeaway is that the OH bond strength of the product in this reaction is only about 74 kcals per mole. So this puts a limit on the kinds of CH bonds we can break. But uh, uh, John was able to, I guess I don't show it here, demonstrate a catalytic cycle whereby silver was used as, as the oxidant and the base, silver oxide, oxidant and the base, to demonstrate a catalytic cycle using the cube. And that was just for uh, cyclohexadiene, right? So pretty e easy substrate. But um, our DFT collaborator, David Ballcells, uh, calculated that the transition state looks something like this. So the cobalts are cooperating in the sense that they are involved in accepting with the oxygen, the bridging oxygen, and accepting the hydrogen atom as it transfers from the substrate. So that, uh, again, supports the model for a concerted proton electron transfer. Okay, I mentioned uh, the problem with uh, tuning the redox potentials uh, in the context of the model for the OEC. And uh, so cobalt is not manganese in that sense. And also in terms of this chemistry. So if we want to raise the energy of that bond, there are several ways we can go about doing that. One is to install hydrogen bonds in the rest of the cube. And uh, we're looking at that to some uh, extent that brings up its own problems. but easy solution would seem to be change the metals in the cube. And in fact, uh, mixed metal oxides are known to be better in many respects for a reaction like uh, oxygen evolution, water splitting. That's seen, for example, in doping manganese into that layered cobalt structure. That gives a catalyst that has a lower overpotential and it's more efficient. So how do we get manganese into the cube? Well, Andy came up with this idea to, to just start with three cobalt twos and permanganate, and everything should assemble with the permanganate giving the four oxygens in the cube, and it works. So it gives a 50% yield of this manganese tricobalt a cube, which we need to study more, but in collaboration with Dave Britt, uh, we were able to see that the spin density on this manganese is coupled to the cobalts. So there is some spin to localization, uh, albeit uh, small, in, in cubes like that. Now, adding other metals brings up uh, another uh, interesting facet of the OEC. I mentioned the dangler. So this is a very simple model cartoon of the OEC. And the role of the dangler has been difficult to, to really sort out. And here are two possible roles that this dangler might play. Uh, it might be a redox switch. So it, it, when it's oxidized to the right state, it, it uh, brings about a conformational change in the cube, which, which makes the cube more reactive towards substrate water. Other uh, postulates have that dangler being more directly involved, you know, O-bond formation and giving a, high valent oxo species like this. 
and being involved in the manner that you see here. So this is a, is a big uh, goal in our group, to synthesize dangler species where we can interrogate some of these models. And there are just very few dangler complexes that have been reported in the literature. We were able to make one, which is the, the species that you see down here at the bottom. And this is by adding cobalt-2 to the manganese complex that I showed earlier. And that gives this dangler species, which has interesting electrochemistry in that the redox events are separated energetically, unlike they are in, uh, in the parent cube. We can't really assign each of those events yet, but it's an indication that that dangler can really dramatically affect transformations of, of the cluster as a whole. Somebody who has spent a lot of time working on this dangler problem is Alex Wheeler. Met somebody today who knows Alex. Um, Alex just graduated and uh, he just published a paper on the interaction of manganese acetate with uh, a cubane species, a variety of cubane species actually. But uh, these reactions are uh, not like the cobalt one that installs a dangler, but rather uh, lead to an exchange of metals in and out of, of the core of the cube. So you see here that manganese comes in, displaces cobalt, and you get a cubane that we had before, but this is a different way to make it. And our hope is that this is going to open the door to other uh, types of, of metal substitutions that are rather like galvanic metal exchanges, where you can use a redox process to exchange one metal or the other. So how, how general is this? We just published this in, in a kinetic and, uh, and chemical investigation of how this works. And I'll just summarize that mechanistic information here. We're quite convinced that the cube binds the incoming metal as a Lewis acid like this. And then there's an electron transfer that occurs that, that converts one cobalt-3 to a cobalt-2. That weakens the linkage of that cobalt in the core of the cube to an oxygen. And the manganese-4 that's produced now fits in perfectly. And so it swings down as the cobalt-2 swings out. There's that reorganization, we come by decoordination to the final product. So we do have a couple of new uh, cubanes that we've been able to make this way. It could be that all you need to do is bring in an electron, so a reducing metal. And so we've seen it work in a couple of cases, uh, in addition to what I just showed you. One has to do with vanadium. So vanadium-4 reacts under conditions that supply protons and uh, a little more oxygen. So that has to do with the conditions that have to be used for this, but it installs a vanadium-5 oxo unit in one corner. Uh, the anion is the displaced cobalt-2 that you see here, hydrogen bonded in the direct product to the cube, but that can be removed uh, in, in, with basic alumina. So we're now studying this vanadium oxo system, the cluster is harder to oxidize. So this we think is a pathway to uh, making stronger bonds to the oxygen core and breaking stronger bonds in substrates. That's the main pathway we're taking for that. Uh, the other metal that we've introduced with some success has to do with, with ruthenium, and that's worth pointing out because ruthenium is the most commonly studied metal in the context of molecular water oxidation. The first system reported to do that reaction is Myers Blue Dimer. That goes back quite a long time. But since then, many other ruthenium species have been reported to do this chemistry. I've always thought, you know, this is a prime example of a case where the oxidant, the oxidizing conditions would make ruthenium oxide, which is about the best catalyst for water splitting. 
Uh, I think there is good evidence for molecular behavior in these systems, but the main thing I want to point out is that in all the mechanisms that have been interrogated and uh, suggested, the main intermediate is this ruthenium-5 species that you see down here at the bottom. So it's easy to imagine how water coordinates, gets deprotonated, you oxidize, you eventually get to this ruthenium-5 oxo. What's not clear is, again, whether two of these come together to make the OO bond like that, or whether this species is, undergoes nucleophilic attack by an oxygen species like that. So that's yet to be resolved because there are almost no ruthenium-5 oxos uh, that have been reported. JOM uh, was able to make several very easily by using the same approach that we use with permanganate. So if you do the same reaction with peruthenate, you get these ruthenium-5 oxo species, and the ligands on the cluster can be varied. And that variation allows us to tune, to some extent, the uh, ruthenium oxo stretching frequency, the uh, the structures, and even the chemistries. This is the electrochemistry. So that changes as a function of electron donor or acceptor groups on the pyridines. And that uh, is seen here. So definitely some electronic communi communication that's operating through the cube in that case. And uh, it, this oxo, I, I can't say much about the water splitting reaction, unfortunately. It's too complicated for us at the moment. But with respect to an organic substrate like, like this, the hydroanthracene, we can see that there's a CH cleavage, CH bond cleavage. This is a lot of the kinetic uh, and mechanistic information that John was able to put together. But the bottom line is high isotope effect indicating uh, rate determining uh, hydrogen atom transfer to the oxo. The thing that's different about this system with respect to others that are well known in biology, like P450 and non heme diiron systems, is that these typically operate by some kind of rebound mechanism where a hydrogen atom is transferred and then the resulting hydroxide rebounds with the radical that you form. And uh, that's just not what's happening here. So in this case, the hydroxide that we form is stable enough to persist. And the radical then is more reactive in a second order process with unreact yet unreacted oxo to give this different product. Okay, the final topic I wanna uh, hit on has to do again with electron transfers between cubes and uh, the, the whole question of how holes move around in these little fragments of oxide. Now, this is interesting in a couple of contexts that I've already mentioned. One is that in the, the moth type material that I showed you, there's good indication that there's redox disproportionation there. But certainly, we're seeing it from kinetic data in solution. So that made us think about linking the cubanes together in different ways. And that raises a number of interesting questions, I think. Like, what is the electronic structure? Would electrons in two cubes uh, be coupled or could we make them be coupled? Uh, could one uh, cluster act as a, as a charge reservoir for uh, high oxidation state species and oxidation reactions? And the person who's taken up this challenge is Vincent Motti, who, who you see here. And the first system that he was able to make this uh, is not a great yield, but I was surprised that he could fish this out at all. Uh, it's, it's a reaction that involves substituting the 4,4 prime by pyridine for pyridines that are in a cube, but he has enough of this bis cube species to look at the structure and the electrochemistry. The electrochemistry is shown over here to the left, uh, and what it, it shows is that the two cubes here are acting independently. There's just a two electron oxidation that system. So, of course, uh, what you want to do is shorten the linkage and bring the, the cubes into closer contact. And so we were able to do that with pyrazine. Now you can see two closely spaced oxidation events 
right. for oxidation of the cluster. And we attribute that to a first and second oxidation. And uh, the way that would go is indicated by the cartoons shown down here. Not a lot of separation. So that means there's not a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, coupling in that system. This is a, uh, something you can interrogate by looking at uh, you know, Sutton and Talby's theory, which indicates that you can take this electrochemical data and convert it to a comproportionation constant. So that indicates the equilibrium between the uh, monooxidized state and the doubly oxidized state is indicated here. And what this is saying is that the equilibrium constant is pretty low. But how can we tune that? Uh, what we found is that if we increase the donor strength of the ligands on the cubes, then that equilibrium constant uh, increases. So uh, we can we know how to change that comproportionation constant. This is just that data again. Uh, and uh, we can isolate the doubly oxidized cubing shown here. We're very uh, interested in looking at this now in, in the context of water oxidation and other physical parameters. And of course, trying to oxidize the mixed valence states. We haven't been able to do that. Those comproportionation constants aren't quite high enough. And uh, the way we think about that is in terms of the simple energetic model here, where the donation, donating ligands are just raising the orbitals on the metal to make uh, uh, give you a better energetic correspondence between those cubes and the linkers. I'll just say briefly that with the ruthenium systems, John was able to make uh, this cubane that are linked to an oxygen and isolate the 4, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 5. Uh, examples of that. That's an ongoing study. We'd like to get some XAS data on that system, but the comproportionation constant there is 10 to the ninth, meaning that it's, it's a delocal for the four pump. So it's, it's a delocal system. Okay. So some concluding remarks. Uh, these cubane structures are interesting models and starting points for catalyst design, I think, for water splitting and bond activation. One of the most surprising things that came out of the mechanistic study is that you have to doubly oxidize those cubes to get water splitting to occur. The core oxos are not involved directly in that chemistry and making OO bonds. Very synthetically versatile systems. I think that is going to uh, play well in terms of developing this, these systems further. And uh, uh, the, we've seen a lot of evidence for cooperation of the metals and the chemistry that they do. Uh, over here on the left, I've listed everybody that's contributed to this Cuban project, beginning with Andy, who's just a, a brilliant scientist, and a couple of recent pictures of the group. I want to thank the DOE and uh, LBL uh, and the collaborators over here. And uh, and you, again, for having me here and for paying attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So first, I think students' questions first before we get to Ben. Question I wanted to ask your opinion on. When we think about the mechanism to take these cubanes, do you think it's meaningful to talk about the oxidation state of any of the individual cobalt sites? Or should we be thinking about it like the total electron count of the cubane? Well, remember where you are, John. <laughs> um, I, I think oxidation state formalism in this context only good for uh, bookkeeping, you know, so I, I describe the same system as four, four, and five, right? Uh, that's just indicating how many holes are there. The question of what orbitals are involved in housing the electron holes with the electrons there is an open question. And uh, I, I, I tried to make that point uh, 
at, at some point in my talk. I think it's one of the most interesting uh, things to take up now. We, what we've been doing is uh, looking at spectroscopy of uh, those kind of systems to see uh, if we can, you know, assign mainly two peaks that we see that look like intervalence charge transfer bands. Now, those bands are not sensitive to solvent and many other factors, so we don't think they're localized. We think they're delocalized. I don't think I don't think the the uh, uh, you know I think the jury's still out. Does, I don't, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. One student request anymore? All right, I didn't have that. Okay, one more student. <laughs> So uh, in your proposed mechanism for this uh, uh, first initial <coughs> oxidation and then coupled by a second step of the disproportionation that give you second order kinetics. So the, the proposed mechanism doesn't require in the disproportionation step for the two, two bands to intact. So I, so I wonder whether you can actually replace one of the molecule by external oxidant so that it can independently tune the kinetics of the first order kinetic step and the second order kinetic step. Yeah, yeah. that second order term there yeah. is just due to a second oxidation. Right. I think that second oxidation could be brought about by lots of different things with the way. Yeah, that's that's I won't be just So you have isolated cubes on the surface and you oxidize, that would work. We haven't done it, but I'm pretty sure. Okay, talk. Uh, so my, my question goes to uh, when you have the water molecule on the ruthenium cobalt center, I want to have an of your insight. Like, so the water molecule first land on the ruthenium size, then form a bridge size with cobalt. Ruthenium. Ruthenium, yes. I didn't talk about much water chemistry. Yeah. No. Oh, you want me to open up about that? Yeah, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, uh, you know, we don't see clean chemistry like that in that system. That's the problem. So we try that in water and, you know, limited amounts of water to see, you know, what species might, we might be able to observe. And the first things we observe have to do with destruction of the oh, it's unfortunately. So we need a better, a better method for capturing intermediates or stabilizing them. But yeah, I mean, it'd be great to uh, be able to see how that ruthenium 5 oxo behaves toward water. But, you know, like points I was making about the kinetics, you need to be able to, to really uh, track down the intermediates that are involved in their Kinetic relevance and whatever. Yeah. Trying to make an analogy to just like ruthenium oxide, solid yeah. at the surface. Yeah. In that case, it's, it's uh, hydrogen superoxide, which is uh, on the landing on the ruthenium size. Right. Thank you. Maybe there's a way to get at that that we haven't, like putting the, the, these clusters into a network or something. The stabilizer and using that as a matrix isolation method to, to look at that. That would be the next thing I would want. <clears throat> so the kinetic stuff is actually measured, but those are those are intermolecular or intramolecular. Or what, what type of or the ruthenium? Yeah, yeah. Were they just per protein, uh in one tube and uh, per deuterium in another? We've done it both ways. I don't remember which. Yeah, there's, right? There, no, there should be no, not the twenty. There should be a big difference. There might be a big difference if you do the intramolecular right. versus internal experiments. But that, that's not that. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I uh, some of the isotope effects and other ruthenium oxo systems that have been measured. I mean, that's ours is ruthenium five, but. Meyer has some of these isotope effects that are 
Yeah, it was, it's, yeah, it was really huge. All right. Um, we had to bump and set our 3 30 today to keep it in this room because it's on a Thursday. But tomorrow it's at four o'clock back in this room, okay, for the second talk. And it'll be a uh, material story to talk with a lot of organic chemistry in there. So uh, come back tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.